time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook. And first up, marijuana. It's a divisive topic that has implications not only for public policy, but also for the health sector. In Colorado, recreational marijuana has been legal for four years and medical marijuana even longer, 16 years. Doctors there are staying vigilant of potential marijuana-related health problems. And John has a look at one of them. I thought I was dying. For more than two years, Lance Crowder was having severe abdominal pain and vomiting. No local doctor could figure out why. Finally, an emergency room physician in Indianapolis had an idea. And the first question he asked is if I was taking hot showers to find relief. When he asked me that question, I basically fell into tears because I knew he had an answer. The answer? Cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, or CHS. It's caused by heavy, long-term use of various forms of marijuana. For unclear reasons, the nausea and vomiting are relieved by hot showers or baths. They'll often present to the emergency department three, four, five different times before we can sort this out. Dr. Kenan Hurd is an emergency room physician in Aurora, Colorado. He co-authored a study showing since 2009, when medical marijuana became widely available, emergency room visits for CHS in two Colorado hospitals nearly doubled. In 2012, the state legalized recreational marijuana. It's certainly something that before legalization we almost never saw. Now we're seeing it quite frequently. Outside of Colorado, when a patient does end up in an emergency room like this one, the diagnosis is often missed, partly because doctors don't know about CHS and partly because patients don't want to admit to using a substance that's illegal. CHS can lead to dehydration and kidney failure, but usually resolves within days of stopping drug use. That's what happened with Crowder, who's been off all forms of marijuana for seven months. Now all kinds of ambition has come back. I desire so much more in life, and at 37 years old, it's a little late to do it, but better now than never. You know, this syndrome's probably very under-recognized, under-diagnosed, because it's only been known about for about the last 10 years. So nobody knows exactly how common it is, but I want to emphasize it's not just in states that have legalized recreational marijuana. Sure. I mean, this is, I don't think a lot of people have even heard of this. Had you heard of this, John? I had not heard of it. Wow. So uh, yet again, uh, CBS News teaching, <laughs> teaching me something. <laughs> um, but I think it's important to know not just about the risks, but about the possible benefits of marijuana. I mean, you're talking about this endocannabinoid system, this amazing system that's all throughout your body and it's involved in all sorts of things, pain, perception, mood, even immunity. Mm -hmm. And there are obviously going to be some potential medical uses for it, and we need a lot more research. So there's eight states, including the District of Columbia, that have actually passed recreational me medical marijuana. Right. Uh, what do you think the impact would be on the medical community at this point? Well, I think it's going to it's going to be huge, and, and I should emphasize again also, right now in America, the majority of Americans feel that recreational marijuana should be legalized. Mm -hmm. So the, the issue is, if it's going to be legalized, we have to do it in the most responsible way possible. And I think there's a lot of responsibility on the part of, of doctors like me. For one thing, we need to be involved in education. Uh, so we have to obviously, uh, adolescents need to know about potential risks, you know, things that are obvious, like you don't want to drive while stoned and the, the possibility of interaction with alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, and also heavy marijuana use, it, it looks like it may have a damage on the developing brain. But on the other side of that is, as I mentioned before, potential benefits. And we have to educate ourselves about that. When you think about this endocannabinoid system, um, there have been possible benefits uh, of medical marijuana for mm -hmm. things like uh, pain, chronic pain, mm -hmm. spasticity, um, even epilepsy. And think about the medicines that are available right now, things like for high blood pressure. The way they were developed was by understanding on a molecular basis, yep. very, very, very low level, what exactly is going on in the body. So once we know what causes high blood pressure, we figure out ways to tinker with the, the body's normal system and lower the blood pressure. Hmm. Same thing with the endocannabinoid system. We have to learn on a molecular basis exactly what's going on and think about once we understand that, how to tinker with it and maybe be able to help all these things, pain, the other things that I've mentioned, we need a lot more research. And doctors, I think, need to really push 
getting that research, research done. Well, moving on to the next topic, the year 2016, it's impossible to discuss all the big health stories of the year. However, few have received as much attention as Zika has in the 2017 spotlight. What do you think still needs to be done when it comes to Zika? Oh, a ton. I mean, this is a huge thing because this is the first mosquito-borne illness ever described, ever known, to cause a birth defect. And it's the first mosquito-borne illness ever known to be sexually transmitted. In the last year, we've learned a ton. Yeah. We've heard about in Latin America, the birth defects, microcephaly, and other things. Now we learn it's the tip of the iceberg. There are other things that are happening. Um, I spoke to the CDC uh, recently. They said, you know, it is still some ongoing transmission in Miami, uh, Dade, and also in uh, Texas, in Brownsville. Uh, and there, there's a yellow warning there, which says that pregnant women should consider postponing travel there. I would say for people to go to the CDC website, just Google CDC and Zika to find the latest. But the bottom line right now is there's a lot of things that we don't know. I just also spoke to Tony Fauci, head of infectious diseases for the NIH. You know, there's no effective vaccine, although there's good progress on it. There's no effective treatment right now. So many questions. What are the other manifestations? What's a good way of diagnosing? Because we don't really have great diagnostic testing right now. And it's not just pregnant women. I mean, other people should be It's not just, but, but it is not just pregnant women. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, has to get communicated is um, it's sexually transmitted and it's in the semen. In, in a couple of cases for uh, six months. How long can it persist? You know, how best to protect ourselves and how frequent is sexual transmission? We've been blaming the mosquito the whole time. How, how about mosquito, how about the sexual transmission? Right. Another major crisis facing the opioid crisis. Right. Uh, the, uh, for the first time, the, the, the Surgeon General released a report um, on, on, on the substance abuse ep epidemic. President Obama signed the 21st Century Cures Act, which puts some funding towards this. Is, is it enough? How, what do we need to do here? Bottom line is we are way behind the eight ball here. We have to get going. It's a billion bucks to try to uh, help the states address this, but more than 52,000 people died in 2015 yep. of opioid overdoses, and since 200,000, more than 300,000 Americans have died. Uh, we just have to do better in terms of pain control. Doctors have to learn a lot more about how to prescribe these and how not to overprescribe them. And for the first time, the UN actually held a meeting on antimicrobial resistance. What is this exactly, and does this start with prescriptions? It totally does. I mean, the CDC estimates that about a third of the 150 million prescriptions that are written each year are unnecessary. And overprescriptions can lead to antibiotic resistance and to all sorts of problems like something called C. difficile uh, colitis, which is a severe form of diarrhea, allergic reactions. Doctors have to resist that temptation. You know, the patient comes in, they want something for their cold. Right. Colds are caused by viruses, not treatable by antibiotics. And we have to say, look, I'm going to educate you about this. You don't want to cause a problem. You don't want the bugs in your own body to get resistant. And we, we have to be, be careful about this. And also, there's a big role of um, overuse of antibiotics in, in the farming industry. So we still have a lot left. And I'm sure we'll here. be talking about all of this in 2017. I'm sure we will. Dr. John LaPook, thanks.